Governor Brainerd, thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure to have you with us today. Well, thank you. It's a pleasure to join you for this conversation. And thank you to all of those who are joining us live on Twitter and YouTube. Governor Brainerd, let's get into it. This morning, the Labor Department said that consumer prices rose 1.2% in March to a year over to a year over year rate of 8.5%, a new four-decade high. Core prices, excluding food and energy, were somewhat less boomy, rising three-tenths of a percentage point. Was there any takeaway for you from this report? Does it change your outlook or your preferred path for policy in the coming months? Yeah, I think there are two developments in the CPI inflation data uh, for March uh, that were notable. Uh, the commodities price shock associated with Russia's invasion of Ukraine is driving that very high top line inflation number you see. And in particular, in uh, today's CPI reading, energy prices accounted for nearly 70% of the monthly headline reading, particularly gasoline prices at the pump. And food contributed another 10%. Those price increases are particularly painful for lower income families who spend a larger share of their income on food and transportation. The CPI data also showed a notable slowdown in core inflation. Uh, it fell from uh, 0.5 month over month the last few months to 0.3 uh, in the latest print. And core inflation is the component of inflation that, that most closely reflects the strength of domestic demand. And I'm most focused on for purposes of assessing the appropriate path of monetary policy. And then looking within that, I think it's notable that core goods, which, which has been the source of an outsized amount of core inflationary pressure, moderated more than expecting, more than, than I had anticipated. So if you look in, in terms of the overall core CPI, um, the prices in core goods have been responsible for almost half of the increase in core inflation over the past year, um, even though they normally account for only about a quarter of the overall. So it's very welcome to see the moderation as category. And I'll be looking to see whether we continue to see uh, moderation in the months ahead. We did see some upward pressure in core services, and in particular uh, in energy price sensitive. Uh, airfares, but there was some moderation in rents, uh, which is also uh, notable. I, I wouldn't take a lot of signal from any one month of data, but I will be watching carefully for a continuation of this kind of pattern with moderating core inflation and a declining number of categories seeing outsized price increases in the months ahead. And as we've said, uh, inflation uh, is too high and getting inflation down is going to be our most important task. But thanks, Governor Brainerd. Uh, since this is the WSJ's job summit, uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, or I'll ask you a little bit about the labor market uh, and might come back to inflation in a minute. Uh, you gave a speech last fall talking about the prospect for a durable recovery in labor participation or the number of people who are either working or looking for work. And on one hand, more workers uh, looking for jobs might take some of the boil off of wage growth that we've seen. On the other hand, it's possible, I guess, that an increase in overall incomes as more people uh, come into the job market could keep demand elevated. So how has your outlook for the labor market changed over the last six months? Yeah, so I think um, what we've seen um, in the labor market and the economy overall um, is very strong demand, uh, demand that has been um, particularly concentrated in durable goods um, relative to services. And that is also, I think, uh, reflective of um, the pandemic. And then labor supply uh, that has been slow to respond to that really strong labor demand for reasons that appear to be um, quite clearly related to the pandemic. And you see that in the surveys, whether it's been um, caregiving constraints um, or fears of the virus that have been keeping uh, people from returning to the labor force. 
Uh, so right now we're seeing a historically high level of job openings, which reflects uh, that the demand for workers is well above um, the current supply. But what has been very encouraging in the last uh, few months of the employment reports um, is uh, that we are seeing um, a rebound in participation. It's, it's normal for labor force participation to recover more slowly uh, than unemployment declines in most recoveries, but this cycle, it's been particularly acute, uh, again, because of pandemic constraints. So as we see um, in the last uh, two months of employment data, you had prime age labor force participation um, jumping uh, for women um, in the most recent and for uh, men. Uh, in uh, the, the report prior to that. But the share of the population that's employed is still about one percentage point below its pre-COVID level. And participation rates are also still down. So there's room to run there. Um, and more broadly, I expect demand to moderate. Uh, fiscal uh, is going to be a drag this year. Uh, financial conditions are tightening. We're going to get some um, spillover from slower growth abroad. And so you know, I do expect those supply uh, constraints to lift at the same time as we see uh, demand uh, moderating. And that's why um, we can expect to see the recovery sustained even as we bring inflation down. In the Fed's most recent projections at your March meeting, uh, many of your colleagues saw the unemployment rate holding at three and a half percent near uh, current low levels over the next few years. That's below the 4% level that uh, you or your colleagues estimate is likely to uh, materialize over the long run. Those projections also saw inflation coming down to 2% over the next few years, even though interest rates don't rise uh, very much above 2%. Now, Larry Summers said recently that this is an example of wishful and delusional thinking. And, and so I wonder, how is it that you can have inflation coming down closer to 2% with the labor market staying possibly quite tight? Yeah, so um, I think the, um, the um, forward uh, trajectory of demand um, is set to moderate. Um, and uh, that's for a number of reasons. Uh, again, just going through them really quickly, fiscal support is a substantial drag this year. Um, Financial conditions are already tightening. And when we think about um, what affects um, business investment, household durable goods um, uh, purchases, it's really those broader financial conditions facing uh, businesses and households. And we've already seen a nearly two percentage point increase, for instance, in mortgages. So um, those financial conditions will also uh, bring demand to a more sustainable level. Um, and we also should see some rotation of demand as uh, pandemic constraints uh, continue to lift. Um, we should see uh, some return to historic patterns of greater relative demand for services and less pressure in that supply constrained durable goods sector. Um, and of course, as we were just discussing on the supply side, I'd expect to see um, continued uh, improvements in labor force participation. So as we continue to um, move forward on our plan um, to move um, the uh, uh, financial conditions to more neutral levels using both our policy uh, rate and uh, balance sheet tools, you know, I'd expect to see labor demand uh, coming down. And that should take place um, in large measure um, through a reduction in the current very elevated uh, level of vacancies. So, you know, I think there's plenty of room um, for businesses to reduce the job, uh, the number of job openings. Um, and so I don't see um, that uh, as we uh, go forward on this path of moving uh, monetary policy to more neutral level. I, I really see that as being consistent with both bringing inflation down and sustaining the recovery. Two big developments so far this year, of course, have been Russia's invasion of Ukraine, 
Uh, you referred to this last week as a seismic geopolitical event. And then also we're seeing uh, some pretty sharp lockdowns again in China. How do those two developments change the outlook you have for inflation uh, this year and, and perhaps next year? Yeah, so um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine is, as you said, it's a seismic geopolitical event. It's a human tragedy, um, but it is also um, a very um, important uh, contributor to inflationary pressures. Um, in particular, we're already seeing it through commodities prices. We talked about this morning's really uh, large increase in prices at the pump. That's uh, That really reflects the Russia shock. Um, and it probably skews risks to the upside in inflation and to the downside on economic activity, particularly abroad, but that can have some implications here. So we've already seen um, prices of energy and other commodities moving up. We've seen that in nickel, for instance. Um, we're seeing it uh, in uh, other areas like fertilizer. Um, and of course, we've seen uh, the price of rent crude moving up by about 12% on net since the invasion. Um, and you know there are also likely to be um, some knock-on effects uh, for global supply chains as Europe, for instance, takes on board uh, this uh, large shock to natural gas prices that can be expected to both uh, affect demand uh, and supply. And, and that can have some knock-on effects here. Um, the longer the conflict persists, the more it escalates, the greater the potential uh, risks, again, uh, to the upside on inflation and to the downside uh, on activity. You also mentioned China. You know, China is uh, right now um, uh, continuing its um, zero COVID lockdown policy, seems to be having a notable effect on activity. Um, it certainly has um, the potential to um, lengthen out some of those constraints that we've seen in uh, supply chains. Um, we've certainly seen uh, with the previous surges uh, that they've led to port shutdowns in China. They've led to indeed uh, increased uh, chip delays. And so there too, this is just a, 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 another set of inflationary shocks. And of course, you know, the economy has um, sustained now uh, a number of these kinds of inflationary shocks from external events, uh, whether it be pandemic, uh, now Russia, Ukraine, lockdowns in China. Um, we've seen a lot of resilience, um, but we've also seen very high inflation. You spoke in a speech last September about good reasons to expect a return to pre-COVID inflation dynamics. You cited underlying structural features of a relatively flat Phillips curve, uh, where lower unemployment rates don't necessarily push prices up all that much, low equilibrium interest rates, low underlying trend inflation. Is that still your base case scenario for once we get through this period? Yeah, so I think um, it is uh, too early um, to have great confidence in um, what the post-pandemic, post-Russia, Ukraine contours of the new normal are likely to be. Um, in terms of uh, the um, level of the real um, long run uh, neutral rate of interest, uh, the rate of interest uh, that economists think of as being consistent with full employment and low stable inflation. You know, there are good reasons to think that will uh, continue to be uh, at levels uh, that are quite low relative to the historical experience. Um, but again, you know, I, I think we uh, need to see um, how the economy evolves. Clearly, we've experienced a series of very uh, large inflationary shocks, um, and the committee is committed to bringing inflation back to our 2% goal. Um, and our framework is very focused on um, the uh, keeping uh, inflation expectations anchored at 2%. Uh, so I think um, there we can anticipate um, that uh, inflation will also return um, to those levels uh, over time. Um, and of course, we have a, a labor market um, that over a longer period of time has proven to be quite elastic. But in the short 
run um, has been very uh, affected by COVID. Um, and so it'll take more time uh, than I think anybody would have anticipated uh, to be able to assess those contours of the new normal. You spoke last week in a speech about moving policy settings expeditiously to uh, be closer to a neutral interest rate. And, and you spoke a little while ago about uh, getting financial conditions to a more neutral level. Where is right now, or maybe by the end of this year, where might a neutral interest rate or a neutral rate setting when combined with the runoff of the Fed's asset portfolio, where might that be around the end of this year? Where is a neutral rate in your view? Yeah, so it's a good question. The neutral rate is a longer run concept. Uh, as I noted earlier, it's the level of interest rate that's neither expansionary uh, nor contractionary when the economy is at full employment with stable inflation. Um, in terms of um, where um, the policy rate is likely to be heading over time, I'd say both um, the last uh, projections that we had from the committee, as well as the minutes um, and market pricing, the median uh, funds rate path does rise over the course of this year. Um, and uh, we've indicated that it's likely we'll begin, we will um, we'll decide as soon as May um, to start reducing the size of the balance sheet, in which case those reductions could uh, come as soon as June. And the combination of policy actions along these lines um, should bring the overall policy stance to a more neutral setting over time. But it's important to note that I don't look at one number. Um, and I certainly don't just look at the policy rate because it's the combined impact of our balance sheet and uh, the policy rate on financial conditions. So when I look at financial conditions, I'm really looking at the kinds of um, uh, conditions that are facing businesses and households as they decide whether to make investments. Um, and there, I think the communications about our policy plans have already been tightening those broader financial conditions over the past, you know, really uh, four to five months considerably more than you might be able to discern from just looking at the policy rate alone. So if you look at um, over the calendar year of 2022, market implied policy rate expectations for the end of this year have uh, risen uh, quite a lot. Policy sensitive rates have uh, risen by similar amounts. So we've seen the two-year nominal yield um, going up by a considerable amount relative to early or this year or the end of last year. And five and 10-year treasury yields are about 140 and 120 basis points higher. Um, and so those are all reflecting communication. Um, and as I think I might have mentioned, um, if you look at the 30-year fixed rate mortgage, it's almost two percentage points higher uh, year to date as a result of expectations about our policy path. And again, the combination of the balance sheet with um, increases in the policy rate. There, there certainly have been uh, more aggressive expectations built into financial markets because of the change in the Fed's communications. It's, of course, not just the one rate increase. But as you sit here today uh, thinking about where the, where the economy is, uh, if the goal is to get interest rates closer to neutral more quickly this year, does that mean that you're prepared to support raising rates in half percentage point increments at the next um, at the next Fed meeting, or even at the next two Fed meetings. Well, I would say um, that in terms of um, the communications from the committee, um, uh, you saw uh, that um, we've said, for instance, um, in the in the most recent minutes, that the committee expects to move the stance of monetary policy toward a neutral posture expeditiously. Um, and we are uh, committed uh, to bringing inflation back down to 2%. We're doing that by tightening monetary policy methodically, and it's through a series of interest rate increases, uh, as well as um, beginning that balance sheet runoff with a decision coming, could be um, as soon as May, um, which would lead to reductions in that balance sheet um, starting in June. 
In terms of exactly what the right pace of uh, that uh, set of um, increases in the policy rate from meeting to meeting, I, I don't um, really wanna focus on that, but I would just say the combined effect um, will bring um, the policy stance uh, to a more neutral posture expeditiously um, later this year. Because it takes time for monetary policy to influence the economy, uh, we hear right now economists talking a lot about a soft landing where the Fed is able to raise interest rates to moderate the pace of growth, but avoiding a recession. Of course, achieving a soft landing implies that the Fed will stop raising interest rates before it's too late. So I wonder, do you see any stopping rule or maybe even a slowing rule that would guide your thinking about when a slowdown or even a pause in removing policy accommodation would be appropriate? Yeah, so it's um, a good question. Um, I don't I don't have a stopping rule per se. Um, this is a very unusual um, recovery. Uh, it's just been made uh, more complicated as if the pandemic was not uh, complicated enough by uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Um, so I don't, uh, I don't wanna be um, too uh, rigid in how I think about um, the appropriate course of policy um, over the remainder of this year and into next year. Um, I do expect the combined effect of uh, moving the policy rate to a more neutral level and uh, commencing balance sheet reduction um, to, uh, to, to have the effect of uh, bringing inflation down, uh, seeing some moderation uh, in demand uh, while the supply side catches up a bit. Um, and then I think by moving expeditiously towards a more neutral posture, it provides the committee with optionality in either direction. Um, and so that'll give me a, a, the ability um, to monitor a set of indicators uh, very importantly, of course, inflation and employment, also inflation expectations, um, as well as how the labor market is responding. Um, and that'll provide a sense of how uh, the uh, policy rate um, might evolve beyond that point, um, depending on uh, how much progress we're seeing, in particular uh, on inflation and how well the labor market is holding up. So, Governor Brainerd, what is the goal of Fed policy right now? I hear some people who say that if what's driving inflation is a disrupted supply chain or uh, insufficient supplies of oil or computer chips or housing in city centers, how will higher interest rates address those problems that we're seeing? What is, what is the goal of what the Fed is trying to do right now? Well, I think the goal uh, is very uh, straightforward. Um, we're committed to bringing inflation down to 2% over time um, while continuing um, to sustain uh, the recovery. Uh, and you're right that um, the very high inflation we're seeing right now is the result of uh, a series of inflationary shocks associated both with the pandemic the Omicron and Delta variants, and most recently uh, with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And those are, those are supply shocks. Um, what the Federal Reserve's tools um, are well suited for is helping to bring demand into balance um, with supply over time. And so there, I think the kinds of uh, tightening in financial conditions that we've talked about um, not just what you see in the federal funds rate, um, but that broader set, whether it be um, the two percentage point increase in mortgages, whether it be the increase in the cost of credit um, for businesses, um, those broader set of financial conditions will help to moderate demand, particularly in um, areas uh, where demand has been extremely hot, um, durable goods, for instance, um, and, you know, fiscal um, is also going to be a drag this year. Uh, the global uh, economy uh, looks to be slowing more broadly. That'll also um, spill over into the U.S. All of those things um, should, along with our 
plans uh, on monetary policy bring uh, demand uh, into better balance with supply and alleviate that very high inflation that you've been seeing. So you said over time uh, that inflation should come down to 2%. Over how long do you think it will take inflation to come back to 2%? Yeah, so I'm very wary of making predictions. I think we all should be. Um, we have most recently seen um, a, a, a geopolitical shock from um, Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I don't think that was in my inflation uh, outlook a year ago. It certainly wasn't. Um, Omicron and Delta uh, were surprises, even to many public health experts. It's certainly also hard to predict those kinds of shocks. So I think we're in um, a period of very high uncertainty. I think it's really important to emphasize that. Um, so I'm gonna be very cautious about making predictions, um, but I am looking to the month to month data uh, to get a sense of what's happening on core, uh, core inflation, uh, which is uh, more tightly connected um, to demand. And there again, I think we saw a moderation uh, this month um, in that core goods inflation where we had been seeing outsized um, contributions to inflation for some time. Um, and it's those kinds of developments that will give me confidence uh, that we are um, going to uh, be successful in achieving our 2% uh, goal. Precisely how long that's gonna take, I think it'd be very difficult to estimate right now, just given uh, uncertainty around Russia, Ukraine, uncertainty around uh, China, COVID, and still uncertainty around the pandemic. You noted there, there's a long list of unusual, unprecedented, uh, you know, choose your adjective developments uh, that the global economy has come through. And so when people talk about achieving a soft landing, I wonder, Governor Brainerd, are there any historical analogies or antecedents that you could point to uh, where the Fed is facing something that they attempted back in the past. Is this more like the 1970s, the 1950s? Are there any analogies here that you think are most relevant to either the present circumstance or what it is the Fed is trying to achieve? Well, I certainly think um, that it is helpful um, to think about a variety of past cases, um, both um, where um, we saw hard landings and soft landings to try to um, uh, inform our thinking about the appropriate path of policy and what indicators I and my colleagues should be looking at um, to gauge whether we're um, seeing the kind of progress that we need to see on inflation in particular. But I don't think there's one good uh, uh, analogy in the sense that this is a a quite unique, uh, again, set of circumstances. Uh, the combination of a pandemic uh, and a war, I think is pretty unusual here. Um, and of course, uh, we go into these shocks uh, with very well anchored inflation expectations. Um, and as I look across uh, the dashboard of indicators on inflation expectations, longer term inflation expectations remain well anchored. That's enormously important. Um, and will be very helpful uh, to us. Uh, when I look at the strength uh, in the labor market, uh, there too, I see um, a very high number of job openings. Um, and uh, there, I think there's, there's quite a bit of capacity for labor demand uh, to moderate among businesses by actually reducing job openings. Um, without necessitating uh, high levels of layoffs, for instance. So I think there's some unique features here um, that make this both very challenging, but also um, are important in terms of my thinking about what policy path, um, both policy rate hikes and balance sheet um, runoff uh, will be uh, sufficient to get us um, to uh, the 2% goal. How, how should we weigh the restraint that comes from shrink, shrinking the Fed's asset portfolio versus raising the short-term interest rate? For, for example, how much of an increase in long-term rates do you model from the prospective runoff of those asset holdings? Well, um, our jobs would be a lot easier uh, if we had a uh, 
precise estimate of that, and it was a, a robust precise estimate, just as would be true um, in our discussion earlier about um, the full set of financial conditions that constitute um, neutral financial conditions. But um, it's certainly um, in uh, the case um, in our in our approach um, to getting inflation down uh, that the balance sheet will play an important role. Uh, in removing monetary policy accommodation operating in the background uh, while the federal funds rate serves as our primary active tool. Um, the balance sheet uh, runoff uh, will have, and probably already the expectation of it, it probably does already have important effects on financial conditions. Um, and so together, uh, I think it's important to recognize um, that removing policy accommodation through both tools um, has a has a greater uh, combined effect than either tool on its own. In terms of um, estimates of uh, how great an increase in the federal funds rate is equivalent to a given amount of um, runoff of the balance sheet, there's a range of estimates. Um, I've certainly um, seen estimates um, you know, that I think are widely, you know, accepted in the literature that our balance sheet rundown could be worth um, two to three additional rate hikes over the entire course of the rundown. But I have to say any such estimates come with really wide uh, confidence intervals. Um, and so, you know, if you think about how do you build a direct comparison between the two tools, it's really how much of a reduction the balance sheet would have an equivalent effect on 10-year treasury yields as an increase in the federal funds rate of one quarter percentage point. And we think of those reductions, of course, um, as, as uh, permanent uh, increases. Um, and so, you know, again, a wide range of estimates um, uh, in terms of precisely uh, what those would be. I would not hang my hat on any particular number, um, but it, it's very uh, clear from all those estimates um, that the reduction in the balance sheet um, will contribute to monetary policy tightening uh, over the life of uh, the runoff, um, and that that is in addition to uh, the kind of tightening that we might see through the policy rate. We're almost out of time, but uh, before we finish, our WSJ survey of economists this past week found uh, that our respondents estimated a 28% chance of a recession over the next year. How do you see the risks of a recession over the next few years? Does 28% seem too low, about right, or too high? Yeah. So look, the U.S. economy um, enters uh, this uh, period of elevated uncertainty with a very strong labor market and significant underlying economic momentum. And um, that, I think, uh, bodes well uh, for the ability to uh, bring inflation down while also continuing to sustain the recovery um, and uh, ensure that it's an inclusive recovery. I look at the same things everybody else does. I certainly remain attentive to the shape of the yield curve, and I'm well aware of the historical significance of inversions. Um, but I think that there are different um, parts of the yield curve that are informative, and certainly um, the, the forward part of the yield curve really doesn't um, uh, signal uh, anything of concern there. Um, you know, sort of a later part of the yield curve, um, you know, watching that very carefully. But there are other um, uh, data points inflation, inflation expectations, uh, the evolution of activity um, that are going to be extremely important as I gauge what the right pace of removal of accommodation is. Um, and again, I think there are good reasons um, to think uh, that we can bring inflation down over time, seeing a moderation of demand while the supply side um, continues to recover. Um, and uh, we continue to see um, a strength in the labor market. Well, on that bright note, uh, we are out of time. Uh, thank you again, Governor Brainerd, for joining us today. Well, thank you, Nick. It's a pleasure. And thank you to everyone who joined us on Twitter and on YouTube.